Beyond the Badge is brought to you by Stefan Kadolin of Caldwell Banker Burnett Realty. and the Edina Crime Prevention Fund. Welcome to Beyond the Badge, a program about the inner workings of the Edina Police Department. Thanks for joining us. I'm Officer Brian Hubbard. Some urban designers think that cars, bicycles, and pedestrians can safely share street space. Members of the Edina City Council agree and have directed the Transportation Commission to develop a living streets policy. The goal of Edina's living streets policy will be to develop a balanced transportation system that integrates all modes for users of all types, ages, and abilities. The Living Streets Policy is basically a complete streets policy where we're trying to engage the public for traffic calming, a more pedestrian bicycle friendliness to some of our neighborhood streets and our collector type streets. It'll be a way for us to try to manage our traffic, our other activities, like I said, these bikers and walkers. The Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District and the City of North St. Paul have developed Living Streets Policies and are implementing a new Living Streets Plan. The City of Maplewood is also pursuing a process to adopt Living Streets. Drafting the Edina Living Streets policy could take the Transportation Commission up to 18 months to complete. Though the city does not yet have a Living Streets policy, drivers must remember to share the road. According to Minnesota law, bicycles have the right to operate on all Minnesota streets, roads, and highways, except where restricted. Well, I believe it's important the biking public recognize the state law affords them all the rights and responsibilities that it does the motoring public. If they're not stopping at stop signs, signaling their turns, or yielding to pedestrians and crosswalks, they're breaking the law. And they're also jeopardizing their own safety. Bicyclists may operate in a traffic lane. Bicycles are not required to ride on shoulders or sidewalks. In fact, they are discouraged from doing so. Bicyclists also have all the same responsibilities as drivers of all other vehicles. They must obey all traffic control signs and signals, just as if they were driving motor vehicles. Bicyclists should ride on the road and must ride in the same direction as traffic. It is illegal and unsafe for bicyclists to ride against or facing traffic. Motorists do not expect and are often unable to see bicyclists riding on the wrong side of the road. Bicyclists are encouraged to maintain a three-foot clearance from any motor vehicle, even when riding past a parked car or cars. This is in order to avoid one of the more common bicycling accidents in which a motorist opens the door of a freshly parked vehicle, striking the bicyclist with the door. According to Share the Road, another leading cause of bicycle motor vehicle collisions is the failure of motorists to yield the right of way to a bicyclist, whether at an intersection or along a roadway. In either case, motorists must yield the right of way to bicyclists just as if the bicycle were another motor vehicle. And motorists must maintain a three-foot clearance whenever they are passing or otherwise in proximity to a bicycle. In any community that wants to have safer bicycling, they really need to focus on the five E's, uh, which stand for engineering. Of course, you know, if there's good bike paths and lanes and safe roads, that's one thing, but you also need to have education, encouragement, enforcement, and evaluation. So the Share the Road campaign gets into sort of education and encouragement. Whether you're on a bike or in a car, truck or van, if you happen to be pulled over, smile. It's likely that the incident is being recorded. In-squad camera systems enhance police reporting accuracy and completeness, officer training, investigation of officer complaints, and overall promotion of unbiased policing. Let's visit Officer Aaron White in the field with Lieutenant Jeff Alasky, who will show us ICOP in this episode's segment of How's It Work. Thanks, Brian. We're at the Edina City Hall in the parking lot today for another segment of How's It Work, where we introduce folks to the equipment and the technology we use to do our jobs here at the Edina Police Department. And today I am joined by Patrol Lieutenant Jeff Alasky. Jeff, thanks for being on our show. Thank you, Aaron. The thing we want to talk about today is the in-squad video and audio recording system. Okay. Um, we call it the iCop around here. That's the brand. Very correct, yes. And I'm um, wondering if you can kind of share a little bit about you know, what that system is and why we use it uh, here at the Police Department. What have been the benefits 
of uh, recording contacts in the police cars here at the police department? There's a lot of stuff as far as with the ICOP, what has been a big benefit to the police department. The number one thing is collecting evidence at a crime scene or on a traffic stop, those type of things. Sure. Um, as far as being the patrol lieutenant, for me it's been great when I get a complaint about an officer, that the officer acted rudely or officiously on a traffic stop. Mm -hmm. I'm able to go back and review that. So, so it's been a great tool for Accountability, that. evidence, uh, yes, big factors? very much so. What do you think the officers uh, think about it now that it's been here for a few years? I think it, it took them a while to warm up to it, but I think as the years have gone on, they're quite happy that it has there. It's, a, it's, it's really there for the officer's protection. It's not sure. there to hurt them. So if you're involved in a traffic stop in Edina, it's safe to assume that it's being video and audio recorded. Very correct, yes. All right. Can we hop in the squad car and take Certainly. a look at the equipment? I'd love to show right. you it. So now we're inside the car. Can you show us the equipment uh, inside the vehicle here? Certainly. The nice thing about the ICOP 2020 is that it's actually integrated right into the squad car, you pull out the factory radio and the whole unit fits right inside. There's a portable hard drive, all the controls are up front, it's very user friendly. Sure. So actually you've got a little screen, the radio is integrated like I said, and it's all push button so it's very simple to use. Okay, and I can see on the screen uh, what the, the camera's seeing, can the officer also then play back and, and look at what's... Correct. This is actually a, D, a DVR recorder, mm -hmm. just like people have at home. I mean, we've got a camera system mounted up on the dash. The officers have a portable mic they carry on their uh, lapel or on their duty belt to sure. record all the conversations. Um, very user-friendly, like I said, just like your DVR at home. Yep. Okay. And when an officer conducts a traffic stop, they don't actually have to manually start this each time, correct? Correct, Aaron. Actually, the way this is set up, it can be set up by different functions, but we the one way, as soon as you turn on your emergency lights, the uh, camera starts rolling. Very good. And then the end product, you mentioned the hard drive, is downloaded to the servers here at the police department. Correct. Maybe we can go inside and take a look at uh, the end product, how you Certainly. use it on the desktop. We can do that. All right. So we've moved to the comfort of your office here, Jeff. Take a look yes. at how we use the video in-house once it's been downloaded from the squad cars. Uh, you've got the program open here. Can you show us a little bit about uh, what we can do here? We actually operate from our screen here with the mouse. You've got your play, fast forward, rewind and stop, of course. But what I really like is up here, it has your date and time, the squad number, the officer's badge number up here. Um, and what's nice is you get your vehicle speed of your squad car, say they're running to a medical or something. And also it tells us is his light bar on right here when he's using his brake. Tells us if the microphone is on in the sure. officer. So there's just so many things we can do with this stuff. And actually the nice thing about this is any supervisor can watch this from their desktop. The patrol officer can watch it. And what's nice is here you've got the full screen where you actually can get just like a little TV monitor sure. watching this whole traffic stop unfold. And then uh, you mentioned the, the emphasis on evidence. If a case ends up going to court, uh, how are you able to export this information? What can you do with it? We burn it right to a DVD. And if we make a copy of it, we usually get a copy for the defense attorney will have a copy of it. So sure. if their uh, client is arguing they've been drinking and driving, they'll actually have them weaving in in their traffic lanes, stumbling on the field sobrieties. So the defense actually gets that video prior going to court. So the whole thing, just like we see in your office, can be viewed in a courtroom as well. Correct. Very good. Well, thank you for the overview of the system today. Looks like powerful technology being used at the uh, police department here. Works very well for us. Very good. Thanks for being on the show today, Jeff. Thank you for having me, Aaron. Jeff Velasquez is the patrol lieutenant here at the Edina Police Department, and we'll return to you, Brian. Thanks, Aaron. A team of officers is helping to strengthen the relationship between the police department and community. The Edina Police K-9 unit consists of two teams, Officer Jason Bear and K-9 Blade, and Officer Mike Seeger and K-9 Diesel. Let's go out to the South Metro Public Safety Training Facility, where Officer Aaron White is with Officer Jason Bear to tell us more about the K-9 program. Thanks, Brian. We're at the South Metro Public Safety Training Facility, and today I'm joined by Officer Jason Bear, one of the K-9 officers here at the Edina Police Department. Jason, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. We're here to learn a little bit about the police K-9 program here at the Police Department. We have two K-9 teams, yourself and your partner, Blade, and uh, tell me about the other team real quick. Mike Seeger and K-9 Diesel is the other team. Okay. And uh, let's start with the history. When did the uh, K-9 program begin here at the United Police Department? Originally started back in the 1970s uh, with a handler who ended up bringing his dog to Minneapolis. Okay. And that was the end of the program for them. And then uh, Kevin Raffidal started the program back up in 2002 with K-9 uh, Kodiak. Kodiak, mm -hmm. a familiar dog in the Edina community? Very familiar. Okay. So what makes these dogs unique? Tell us a little bit about Blade. Um, how is a dog found or selected for this role? 
I got him in February after he'd already gone through a selection process over in Slovakia. They test the dogs, make sure they're qualified to come over. They're shipped over on planes. Uh, they come over, they go through another selection process at uh, St. Paul's Canine Training Facility by the head trainers over there. At that point, they're uh, selected to certain officers and they go to certain departments. I got Blade in February. Uh, I've got to bring him home for a couple of weeks prior to a pretty intensive training course put on by St. Paul Police Department. The initial training was 12 weeks long and uh, basically was everything that the dog needed to do to, to crawl. Sure. Not run, not walk, but crawl. Kind of the basics. Of the program. Exactly. And then so. to teach you as well how to kind of continue that process. Absolutely. A lot of the stuff is, is second nature to the dogs, Sure. but not so second nature to the handlers. So, so these aren't dogs that are donated or just uh, found at the local uh, Humane Society, but very specifically selected for the, the program. Yeah. And I, I understand they come at a very high cost. They do. They're absolutely, uh, they're bred specifically for police work. It's all genetics. Um, the dogs, obviously their parents, brothers and sisters, all police dogs. Matter of fact, uh, two of Blade's brothers are currently working, one in St. Paul Police Department, one at Stillwater Police Department. Sure. So. What are the qualities that make a great police dog? A lot of the qualities that make a great police dog are the qualities that don't make them such a good pet. Sure. Their, their drive is extremely high, extremely hyper, if you'd call it that. Um, Basically, it's a toy drive that we look for, so it's the, their willingness to go after a toy because they're willing to do some pretty extraordinary things for a very small prize, sure. which is a ball to them or whatever their, their reward might be, their million dollar bill as we call it. So. And Blade lives with you full time. He does. Yeah. He's with you uh, both at work and home, so uh, probably keeps you on your toes all the time. I see Blade more than I see my wife. So. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about how we use these dogs. Tell us a little bit about what Blade's job is with the police department. Blade's job is unique in that uh, we have our dogs with us all the time while, while we're patrolling. It's not like a, another collateral duty where everything stops and we go to that. The dog is with me all the time. So whether he's, um, his job is protecting me in the squad car, his job is finding bad guys, finding lost people, sure. uh, tracking them. Um, finding lost or uh, stolen articles, sure. evidence. So even when the dog's not doing something specific, um, he's always there with you, always serving as backup on a traffic stop or whatever else. Absolutely, a lot of the times just his presence there, just the barking can be enough to stop a bad guy sure. from fleeing or uh, continuing whatever behavior. The dog does, however, have those special talents and let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, big one is tracking. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the tracking. Uh, tracking, the dog basically puts his nose to the ground follows uh, the scent of that person all the way to where he's, where he's located, so. Okay, and that can be a good guy or a bad guy. Certainly, yep. Um, it's not quite like the, uh, the movie show where you see someone hold up an article in front of their nose and they follow that nose. Sure. Blade's trained to locate human scent and follow that scent uh, basically to its origin. Okay, um, that can be used to apprehend a criminal but it could theoretically also be used to find a, a lost person, a missing child, something like that. Absolutely. If Blade finds a track, uh, it's not necessarily for a bad guy, although bad guys put off a different odor than someone who would be lost would put off. But uh, he doesn't know the difference of who he's tracking necessarily, just if it's a good guy or a bad guy. So sure. he could find either one. And that sense of smell also allows Blade to do drug detection. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, a dog's ability to smell is anywhere between 40 to 100 times greater than a human being. So we use their, their nose more than we use their mouth, more than we use their teeth, you know, contrary to popular belief. So um, he's able to detect uh, any kind of illegal narcotic odor that he's trained on. Sure. Primarily heroin, meth, coke, and uh, marijuana. And uh, he alerts me to the presence of those odors. Your dog, uh, even though he has these talents, the ability to uh, you know, potentially track down and apprehend a, a bad guy, also has the, a very well socialized dog, has the ability to interact with kids at school and those kinds of things. You do a lot of presentations and outreach in the community. We do, and that's part of the job of being a handler is doing those, those things. And it's amazing to see him turn it on and turn it off because he can do so in a split second. Sure. So he knows, basically knows what he's gonna do when he's gonna do it. So if we walk into a crowd of people, he knows that it's time to put on a smile and it's time to, uh, to do a demo versus if it's, we're going into a dark uh, alleyway or whatnot, it's time to find a bad guy. So. Very good. The training continues. How much time uh, do you spend uh, in the week or month uh, just training and working with the dog to keep them uh, 
developing? Yeah, it, it is very labor intensive. Um, generally, we train at least an hour every shift, and then we train a minimum of eight hours every month that's on, on focus training. So. so it's a big job and obviously a big commitment, not just uh, during your working hours, but around the clock. The dog's with you all the time, as you said. And uh, It is, especially uh, when you have a puppy. and Yeah, young dog. He's got a lot of those qualities in him. Sure. So. Well, thanks, Jason, for the introduction to, to the, the program and to the dog and the work uh, of a canine team here at the Edina Police Department. Appreciate your time today. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Officer Jason Bear, his partner is Blade the dog, and uh, we'll return to Brian in the studio. Blade has to demonstrate his skills on an annual basis to keep catching bad guys. Edina 16's Scott Denfeld has more. On one of the hottest days of the year, over 90 canine units from all over the metro gathered in Minneapolis to show off their police skills and to earn the right to keep catching bad guys. Minneapolis Canine Unit is hosting, it's, a, it's an annual Region 12 United States Police Canine Association field trial. And what the trial consists of is six different events in which the dogs have to show proficiency to a, achieve a certification to work the street. Uh, by no means is it is certification a minimum. It's a very it's actually a high standard that dogs have to meet in order to do the things they do every day. So. At the Region 12 K9 trials, Edina Police Officer Jason Bear and his partner Blade braved the heat to achieve certification. It was scorching hot. It happened to be 115 degree heat index that day. No matter how much energy you have, that heat with their winter coats on, with their fur coats on, still takes out quite a bit of energy. So I actually had some uh, dog Gatorade, some stuff with electrolytes and stuff like that to give them so he could stay hydrated, obviously try to keep him in the car as much as possible. That's where it's cold, that's where his kennel is. So, Along with Edina Police Officer Mike Seeger and his partner Diesel, Officer Bear and Blade participated in a number of trials. Ah! Our first event was agility, which is the stuff that you see behind me here. And from agility we went to boxes, which is another thing you see behind me, which is actually a suspect search. According to Officer Bear, the key to success, beyond having a dog who is specially bred for police work, is training and learning. I'm part of a group that uh, trains in the South Metro, and we kind of use those resources of some of the more experienced handlers. Handlers have been around for a long time to help, especially when we're building up a new handler like myself. Yeah, it's a good boy. The key to training dogs is consistency, and just having fun with them. All of that training paid off, and by the end of the trials, the new canine team performed successfully, and along with Officer Seeger and Diesel, were certified to continue keeping Edina safe. For Edina 16, I'm Scott Denfeld. This year's Region 12 Canine Trials were hosted by the City of Minneapolis's Canine Unit. Kids in Edina get to learn safety firsthand at the Edina Safety Camp. But much more goes into planning for all the fun and games than meets the eye. Edina 16's Jordan Gilgenback looks into the details. Uh, Jason Bear. One day each summer, a group of firefighters and police officers trade in their uniforms for t-shirts and spend their day with fourth graders. We plan all year long for this one day event. We have meetings throughout the year. The firefighters and police officers, along with park and recreation staff, organize safety camp to teach kids how to stay safe on the water, around electricity, in vehicles, and when strangers are present. Six of us in the planning, what we call our safety camp committee, and uh, so we have representatives from police, fire, and uh, park and rec, and, from, uh, and Deb here from the training center. One firefighter, one police officer, and two park and recreation staff serve as team leaders for each group at safety camp. Fire Marshal Tom Jensen's favorite part is watching the kids' amazement. <laughs> to help make safety camp even more amazing and effective, he also likes hearing from those team leaders. They're not afraid to tell us what doesn't work. And that's what makes us feel good, that you know they can do some constructive criticism, say, you need to fix this. Jensen also receives immediate gratification at the end of the day. The feedback is, is right here. Parents are even saying thank you. You know, that was great. <laughs> Jensen, along with police officer Nicole Pesic, want these kids to learn from the best, which sometimes proves to be a challenge. Making sure everybody schedules, everybody's on vacation in the summer, so trying to find speakers too speak at safety camp. Many speakers and staff share the same passion for teaching safety as Jensen and Pesic. They continue to show their support by returning year after year. They want to be here and teach. They know how important it is to get the message out to these fourth graders. 
One thing's for sure, according to Officer Pesic, planning safety camp is worth every minute. I love seeing the look on the kids' face when they come to safety camp and the different events that they do. With Aaron Klein, I'm Jordan Gilgenbach, 4 Edina 16. The 2012 safety camp will be in late July or early August. Drivers who are impaired by fatigue, drugs, alcohol, or other distractions, such as cell phones, are a danger not only to themselves, but also to the innocent drivers around them. If you witness any of the behaviors below, call 911 and tell the dispatcher that you are calling to report an impaired driver. Be prepared to describe the make, model, color, and license plate number of the vehicle and provide its exact location. Signs of impaired driving include sudden or erratic braking, drifting, swerving, or weaving, tailgating, driving in the middle of the road or with the left tires on the center line, turning within an unusually wide radius, nearly striking other cars or objects, driving with the face close to the windshield, drinking alcohol in the vehicle, driving much slower than the posted speed limit, rapidly accelerating, illegal or sudden turning, failure to turn on headlights at night, or responding slowly to traffic signals. After recruiting 76 participants to donate blood on behalf of the Edina Police, the department walked away placing third out of 14 departments in the annual Battle of the Badges. Here's Edina 16's Kalen Martin with more on the story. Police and fire departments typically work together across the metro to save lives. However, this June they went head to head to do the same thing. About one in three people needs blood at some point in their life. Um, it is the most common procedure in hospitals. Memorial Blood Center hosts Battle of the Badges twice a year, but earlier this summer the event was a little different at Edina City Hall. The city welcomed city employees and residents alike to participate in this year's blood drive. This year we moved into a larger space and invited the community in also, which is what we did 11 years ago when an officer needed blood real bad, was the community came out and showed their outpouring of support. So we wanted to, to uh, replicate that. The officer was Mike Blood, who, just weeks away from his retirement, was critically wounded in 2000 during a gun battle and ended up needing more than 120 units of blood to save his life. For Battle of the Badges, officers, firefighters, friends, and family are able to donate blood in honor of their favorite police and fire department. The department with the greatest percentage of donors wins the battle. It's just more of a friendly competition than anything. There's no reward other than knowing that uh, you've brought in some blood donors. City employee Steve Grausam has donated blood more times than he can remember. He says it's quick and pain-free. Well, almost. It doesn't take long, and if you can just squint your eyes and go to your happy place when they poke you, then everything will be good. With Max Ornstein, I'm Kaylin Martin, Edina 16. The Anoka County Sheriff's Office placed first in Battle of the Badges with 108 donors, and Minneapolis Police Department placed second with 78. The Edina Crime Prevention Fund, a major supporter of the Edina Police Department, is gearing up for one of its largest fundraisers of the year, the Fall into the Arts Festival. The ninth annual event will be held 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Saturday, September 10th, and 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sunday, September 11th, at Centennial Lakes Park. About 200 exhibitors selling sculpture, glass, wearable art, jewelry, photography, and more will display their works alongside the paved walkways of the park. It has been very successful and proceeds from the festival go back into the crime fund, which is put to very good use. The festival traditionally draws crowds upwards of 20,000 people from the surrounding metropolitan area. For more information on the event, visit www.fallintotheartsfestival.com. On behalf of my co-host, Officer Aaron White, and the rest of the officers of the Edina Police Department, thanks for tuning in to learn a little bit more of what goes on beyond the badge. Stay safe.
Beyond the Badge is brought to you by Stefan Kadolin of Coldwell Banker Burnett Realty and the Edina Crime Prevention Fund.